Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The real story of the Allende years by Jorge Palacios. Part 3. Economic Policy of the Popular Unity Government Chapter 4. Whose interests did the Popular Unity Program attack? The Popular Unity, with its victory in the presidential elections of 1970, only won a small margin of maneuver from the hands of the traditional reactionary ruling circles. It had won a part of the executive power, only a part of it, since many prerogatives of the executive were restricted by the Constitution and the various laws, as well as by the prerogatives of the legislative and judicial powers. Furthermore, within the various departments and government enterprises and public administrations, a large number of officials who had been appointed by the previous governments and who were hostile to the UP enjoyed legal rights of tenure. Many of them, later on, even went so far as to sabotage the decisions of the government, but they could not be fired. In some sectors, a parallel management had to be appointed besides the one appointed by the previous government. This resulted in enormous expenses, since the officials inherited from the previous governments were maintained in almost complete inactivity and could not be removed. All other sections of the state apparatus were dominated by the representatives of the U.S. monopolies operating in Chile, as well as the most powerful internal exploiters, the industrial, commercial, and financial monopolist bourgeoisie and the landed oligarchy. This state apparatus, apart from the executive, comprised the legal system in the service of the ruling classes. The parliament in which the majority opposed the government the courts of justice which were the bastions of the most reactionary circles, the powerful instruments of propaganda, with the opposition accounting for 80% of the daily press circulation, 50% of daily radio ratings, and 60% of the daily television ratings, the Contraloria of the Republic, also led by the opposition, with important rights of inspection over the legal decisions of the government, and finally, and most decisively, the armed forces and police and the service of U.S. imperialism in the most reactionary circles in the country. Even if a large number of rank-and-file activists within the CP and other parties comprising the popular unity, as well as some honest leaders of these organizations, wanted to build socialism in Chile without having any clear idea about the real content of such a socialism, this is not, objectively, what the pro-Soviet CP leaders wanted. For them, socialism was what exists in the Soviet Union, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and in other countries of the Warsaw Pact with which they totally identify themselves. Starting from a dependent capitalism, they hoped to achieve in Chile what had been achieved in these Eastern European countries through the degeneration of socialism. In other words, they wanted a sort of state capitalism in which a new bureaucratic bourgeoisie, with interests opposed to those of the people, is in command of state power and public enterprises, replacing the old capitalists. The idea of linking this state capitalism to the dominant interests of Soviet social imperialism was in no way alien to their plans. Nevertheless, the program put forward by the popular unity, even if it was not to bring about socialism, represented a heavy blow to the interests of the landlords to certain U.S. monopolies operating in Chile, and to the most powerful sections of the industrial, commercial, and financial bourgeoisie. It was precisely at the expense of these interests that the popular unity hoped to develop state capitalism and establish the new bureaucratic bourgeoisie. Therefore, even though the UP program and strategy were nothing but reformism, because the aim was not to thoroughly liquidate the economic power of the ruling classes, nor was it to seize power from them by destroying the state apparatus in a revolutionary manner, nor to put the expropriated means of production or political power into the hands of the people, they came out, given the context, as an ultra-left adventurist program and strategy. 
Economic and social measures were taken as though the prerequisite political power had been seized, while only a portion of the executive power was under control. In essence, the three-year experiment of the UP government was an attempt to take advantage of, or outwit, using legal expedience, laws and institutions that had been designed to serve the most reactionary interests. It was an attempt to limit and overthrow these interests by respecting the rules established precisely in order to consolidate and develop them. In short, it was an effort, with all imaginable shortcomings, to peacefully transform a social system that used the mask of bourgeois democracy for the sole purpose of concealing the armed violence that was its real foundation. It was the failure of an attempt to exercise power without having won it, and without even the intention of using what had been acquired through the electoral victory in 1970 in a revolutionary way in order to develop a fighting mass movement capable of really seizing such power by smashing the armed reactionary apparatus. This last possibility was, in fact, and this is the basic thesis of the present book, absolutely incompatible with the plan for a society based on centralized state exploitation of the people, as was the aim of the pro-Soviet CP leaders and some of their followers within the popular unity. For a people mobilized in a revolutionary way, it would have been easy to turn the guns against the new exploiters, as Frederick Engels used to say. To realize the absurdity of this peaceful road to state capitalism, under socialist disguise, and to grasp the origins of this failure, which was absolutely inevitable in the eyes of anyone who had analyzed this experience from a genuine Marxist standpoint, we have to begin these chapters on the analysis of the economic policy of the UP government with a survey of the reactionary interests that were hit or threatened by the program of this government. 1. The Interests of U.S. Imperialism in Chile The U.S. imperialist domination of Chile was and is exercised in numerous and highly diversified forms. When the Allende government took over, the U.S. monopolies controlled the main Chilean mining resources, copper, saltpeter, and iron. They also controlled certain public utility companies, such as the telephone company owned by ITT. They monopolized a decisive portion of Chile's international trade, buying its raw or semi-manufactured products at very low prices, and selling it back manufactured goods at exorbitant prices. They were either owners or major shareholders of a large number of firms in the manufacturing sector, the most profitable ones. Finally, they exploited the whole of industry through financial loans, selling or leasing technology, machinery, raw materials, spare parts, and fuel, etc. An important item in the tribute extorted by U.S. imperialism from the Chilean economy is represented by the short-term and long-term interest-bearing loans granted by various institutions dependent on the U.S. government. These loans were linked to various demands for the implementation of a policy favorable to the interests of the U.S. monopolies. In general, they were tied loans, in the sense that they had to be invested in the purchase of capital goods or other types of commodities from the United States itself. The investments and loans were always lower than the profits made in the country by those who were granting them, and, therefore, they were coming from the very profits extorted from Chile. At the same time, because of their conditional character, the loans contributed to the further swelling of these profits, to the distortion of economic development, and to the intensification of the crisis and dependence of the economy. As a consequence, the final result was the necessity of ever bigger loans. It was a continuously developing spiral, a vicious circle strangling the economy of the country. During the Allende government, this external debt reached almost $4 billion, considering both of the loans inherited from the previous governments and the new ones. The annual amortization and interest payments on this fabulous debt absorbed over half of the foreign currency inflow. Over 70% of these debts represented loans made by the United States. In 1964, Chile ranked 7th in the world in terms of the volume of U.S. investments, which at that time reached over $1 billion. In 1970, 
there were 110 U.S. companies operating in Chile and a large number of others having U.S. capital but with their main office in other countries. In order to grasp the importance of the capitalist interests hit or threatened by the expropriations carried out by the Allende government, it is essential to say a few words about the large Chilean copper mining industry. There are three major copper mines in Chile, Chuquicamata, El Salvador, and El Teniente. The first two were owned by the giant trust, Anaconda Copper Mining, and the third one by Kennecott Copper. Chuquicamata and El Teniente are respectively the biggest open pit and the biggest underground copper mines in the world. 80% of Chile's total copper production comes from these three big mines expropriated during the first year of the Allende government. Throughout the history of its dependence, it is estimated that Chile has exported around 22 billion tons of copper. In 1970, the year of Allende's election, Chile accounted for 11% of the world's copper production, that is, over 6.2 million tons. The total value of Chilean exports for the same year amounted to $1.123 billion, $700 million of which represented copper exports. It is estimated that between 1911 and 1970, the big U.S. companies exploiting Chilean copper have made over $4.6 billion of declared profits. Analyzing the statistics accumulated up to 1960, the Christian Democratic Senator Radomiro Tomic declared to the Parliament on July 18, 1961, quote, Throughout these 40 years, these companies, referring to the U.S. monopolies exploiting Chilean copper, have withdrawn $3 billion from the country. They started with an initial investment of $3.5 million. Thus, it has been lucrative business. This sum of $3 billion represents one-third of Chile's physical assets, amassed not in 40 years, but in 400 years, end quote. Later on, during the government of his colleague Eduardo Frey, the U.S. companies were to extract in only four years, 1965 to 1968, over $1 billion in declared profits. However, as we have already indicated, copper was not the only source of profit for the U.S. investors. Bethlehem Steel Corporation, a monopoly involved in the exploitation of Chilean iron ore, made $400 million in profits between 1911 and 1970. Anglo Lantaro, also American and owner of the huge saltpeter reserves in the northern part of the country, made $500 million during the same period. ITT, with its investments in telephone and other services, and which was colluding with the CIA in the plans to destabilize the Agenda government, made some $200 million between 1931 and 1970. Its investments in Chile reached about $100 million in 1970. Finally, Chilectra, through which U.S. investors controlled electric energy distribution in Chile, made some $120 million in profits between 1928 and 1969. All these companies, except the last one, were expropriated by the popular unity government. We have only mentioned the profits made by the large mining and public utility companies, over which there is relative control. It is extremely difficult to assess the profits made by the U.S. investors in manufacturing industry, in the wholesale trade companies, and in other enterprises. It is clear, however, that Chile represented an important prey for the U.S. monopolies, not only because of the large investments in the country, but also because of the high rate of profit on these investments. In 1968, with a capital outlay of some $1.4 billion, foreign investments in Chile generated a net profit, that is, taking into account the interest paid in the devaluation of capital, of over $320 million, or 23% of the capital invested. President Allende himself, speaking to the United Nations in November 1972, denounced the fact that the U.S. corporations alone had reaped a profit of almost $4 billion between 1955 and 1970 in Chile. In addition, as we have already pointed out, right at the time the Alliance for Progress was inaugurated by Kennedy, 
there were concrete plans for the U.S. monopolies and investors to take over manufacturing industry during the Frey administration. Investments in this sector, even though they were threatened under the Agenda government, were not substantially hit. The Rockefeller Report, recommending the replacement of political parties with the army in Latin American countries, had precisely this goal to continue the policy of attempting to take over the most profitable manufacturing industries on the continent. The U.S. aid to these countries is itself inspired by this objective. The Foreign Affairs Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives said on this question, quote, The most important reason for this economic aid is that these developing countries are determined to develop and it is only by participating in this process that we will have the opportunity to direct this development in the manner that best suits our interests, end quote. We think that these brief comments on the U.S. monopoly's interests in Chile are more than sufficient to conclude that it was absurd to suppose that the United States would peacefully accept expropriation and the long-term threat posed to their plans for the Chilean economy. Moreover, there was the risk because of the dominant influence of a pro-Soviet CP within the popular unity, of an increasing penetration of Soviet social imperialism in the country. In the past, the U.S. government had interfered to overthrow various governments and embroiled itself in expensive protracted wars to defend economic, political, and strategic interests of much less importance than those in stake in Chile. Therefore, Even if we do not take into account the internal class enemies within the country, and if we just consider the presence of U.S. imperialism in Chile, the plan of peaceful transition to socialism, or what the Soviets and their followers always refer to as socialism, was an absolutely adventurous plan. 2. Landed Oligarchy Another powerful section of the reactionary ruling classes of Chile that the popular unity confronted with its program for reforms was the landed oligarchy. Historically, the power of this class was built through the ownership of huge latifundia expropriated by the landlord's ancestors from the native population of the country. In this way, a monopoly over the best lands of the country was created. The Fourth National Census on Farming, 1965, gives the distribution of land holdings according to their size. Table, structure of land ownership in Chile. Size of holding, less than 10 hectares. Number, 156,708. 1965 area, 437,300. Percent of total number of holdings, 61.8. Percent of total area, 1.4. Size of holding, 10 to 99 hectares, number 74,120, 1965 area 2,348,200, percent of total number of holdings 29.3, percent of total area 7.7, size of holding 100 to 999 hectares, number 19,333, 1965 area 5,572,400, Percent of total number of holdings, 7.6. Percent of total area, 18.7. Size of holding, over 1,000 hectares. Number, 3,331. 1965 area, 22,290,800. Percent of total number of holdings, 1.3. Percent of total area, 72.2. Total number, 253,492. Total 1965 area, 30,648,700, percent of total number of holdings and percent of total area, 100. If we consider as latifundia the holdings of 200 hectares and more, we can see that these landlords, with less than 5% of the number of holdings, own more than 85% of all the agricultural land in the country. On the other hand, 90% of the landlords, more than 200,000, own less than 15% of the agricultural land. To this, we must add 750,000 farm workers owning no land at all and living in severe poverty. Traditionally, the policy of the big landlords has been to cultivate only a small portion of their huge estates, 
ignoring technical progress and brutally exploiting the agricultural workers. Also, through various means, they reduced the small and middle farmers to poverty. In fact, the Chilean landlords took advantage of their rights over large stretches of the best lands in order to enrich themselves not through production, but by sabotaging agricultural production and cattle raising. Protected by their sacred property rights, they kept most of the land under their monopolistic control out of production. In this manner, a chronic shortage of agricultural products, increasing in relation to the population, was created. Since it is impossible to go without these products, food products in particular, this sabotage resulted, on the one hand, in the obligation to import them at high prices from the international market, and on the other hand, in the necessity to bring into the market products cultivated at a very high cost, on lands of poor quality located far away from the consumer centers. Any increase in the country's population aggravated the agricultural crisis created by the latifundists and necessitated ever-increasing imports of farm products, as well as the meeting of the demand for these products with very expensive local goods. Because of the situation that they themselves had created, the latifundists had only to bring their products to market, with very low costs of production, and to sell them at the very high prices resulting from their sabotage, in order to get huge surplus profits, deferential rent, over and above the average profit in agriculture. This extremely retrogressive policy, linked until not too long ago with the semi-feudal forms of exploitation of large sections of the peasantry, payment in kind, personal allowances, sharecropping, etc., allowed the big landlords to accumulate huge profits with minimal investments. At the same time, because of their dominant role within the state apparatus and its institutions, they obtained important credits on the basis of their agricultural estates, the value of which constantly rose because of the ever-increasing prices of farm products. But this never stopped them from refusing any audit of their accounts or allowing their estates to be estimated at their real value for taxation purposes. On the other hand, since their plans were precisely not to make big investments in agricultural production, they channeled their fortunes into speculative and financial operations or used them for investments in import-export enterprises, as well as in lucrative industrial, commercial, or service businesses. In this way, many members of the landed oligarchy became members of the financial, industrial, or commercial monopolist bourgeoisie, or gradually merged their interests with those of these classes. This many-faceted economic power of the landed oligarchy is the reason why it was not completely liquidated. As a social class, by the agrarian reform carried out by the Frey and Agenda governments, which expropriated almost 6,000 latifundia, for a total of almost 5 million hectares of irrigated and non-irrigated cultivable land. At the time Allende took office, the big landlords in particular were still extremely powerful. During the UP government, they maintained this powerful position, despite the expropriation of most of their lands. This was the case because the bourgeois state in which they had and still have a tremendous influence was preserved because the agrarian reform provided high compensation payments for the lands expropriated, as well as the legal obligation to pay cash for their machinery, cattle, seed, buildings, forests, etc. Also, the agrarian reform required that important reserves of the best lands be left to the landlords upon their expropriation. Finally, the landlords remained powerful because of the strong economic influence they had in the banking, industrial, and commercial sectors. Therefore, their political aggressiveness doubled when part of their economic interests were hit by the reforms, which did not completely smash them as a class and which did not seize political power from their hands, political power that they controlled along with U.S. imperialism and the monopolist bourgeoisie, to which, as we have seen, they were closely linked through various interests. To this we must add the aggravating circumstance that the target hit was their agricultural estates, on the ownership of which they based their aristocratic pride and their sentiment of social superiority over those who were only merchants, bankers, or industrialists. It is no accident, therefore, that the popular unity and its government found in the landlords some of their fiercest and most powerful enemies, even though they had quite naively thought that they had more or less been politically and economically eliminated following two agrarian reforms. 
the landlords never accepted any compromise and fought ceaselessly until the overthrow of the government. 3. The Monopolist and Financial Bourgeoisie The other section of the class dominating the Chilean state is the monopolist bourgeoisie, industrial, commercial, and financial, which is closely linked with U.S. imperialism and the landed oligarchy. Within the context of the Third World, Chile is a country which has achieved relative industrial development. The world crisis of the 1930s and the Second World War created difficulties for Chilean imports and exports. As a consequence, the capital previously accumulated by the landlords and by those previously involved in the import-export business was largely channeled into manufacturing industry. Before the world crisis, Chile was the only possessor of natural saltpeter. This fact, in addition to the ownership of coal, copper, silver, and other minerals, as well as the advantage, until the construction of the Panama Canal, that the Strait of Magellan was the only passage between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, resulted in the accumulation of immense fortunes and in the very strong habit of consuming imported goods. Thus, the development of Chilean manufacturing industry was linked to the need for substitutes for previously imported goods once international trade was blocked because of the above-mentioned events. Because of the narrowness of the internal market, this manufacturing industry right from the beginning had a highly monopolistic structure. At the beginning of the first year of the Popular Unity Government in 1971, the Office of Planning, Odeplan, recorded in its annual plan the following structure of the industrial sector. Table, Structure of the Industrial Sector Large-scale industry, more than 200 workers, 3% of total number of establishments, 44% of the total labor force, 58% of total capital, 51% of total value added. Medium industry, 20 to 200 workers, 30% of total number of establishments, 40% of the total labor force, 35% of total capital, 38% of total value added. Small industry, 5 to 20 workers, 67% of total number of establishments, 16% of the total labor force, 7% of total capital, 11% of total value added. To briefly show how manufacturing industry was highly monopolized when Allende became president of the Republic, we can say that 130 industrial firms, representing only 1.2% of the controlled factories, thus called in the census because they hire five workers or more, reaped some 35% of the total value added in each industrial sector, accounted for 40% of the fixed capital, and appropriated some 30% of the gross returns. Moreover, the concentration of capital in large-scale industry was very high in comparison with other industry. Corfo statistics indicate that until 1970, large-scale industry was 180% more capital-intensive than small industry and 50% more capital-intensive than medium industry. The latter, for its part, was 85% more capital-intensive than small industry. Within large-scale industry, nine units accounted for 45% of the total capital invested in large-scale enterprises, or 25% of the total capital in manufacturing industry. As for fixed capital, machinery, equipment, buildings, and facilities, 86% of it was concentrated in the controlled manufacturing industry, and 14% only in the small craft units, almost twice as numerous. In commerce, 12 wholesale trading enterprises, 0.5% of them, made 44% of the total direct sales in the wholesale business. As far as retail trade is concerned, 54% of the firms affected 74% of the sales. Bank credit was also strongly controlled by the monopolistic sections of industry, land, and trade since the bank's boards of directors were closely tied to the big corporations. 1968 data indicate that 2.7% of the private bank's debtors obtained 58% of all credits granted, while 0.4% of debtors obtained almost 30%. On the other hand, during the same period, 28% of the borrowers received barely 2.6% of the total loans. 
the monopolistic sections of industry, land, bank, and trade, closely linked with the interests of the imperialist monopolies, were in full solidarity in their resolute opposition to the Agenda government. The links among them result in the entire Chilean economy being exclusively dominated by 12 powerful clans with extensive branches in monopoly industry, banking, and trade, as well as in the latifundia and external trade. Studies carried out by the Popular Unity's Ministry of the Economy stated, quote, In 1966, 17% of the enterprises controlled 75% of all shares in the limited companies. 28 limited companies controlled practically every sector and branch of the economy. Furthermore, among the 160 biggest corporations, 81 included foreign holdings, of which one-third represented controlling interests, end quote. It is against these 12 clans which controlled and still control the economy and political power of Chile jointly with U.S. imperialism that the main reforms contained in the Popular Unities program were aimed. In one of its points, this program states, quote, The first step in the economic transformation process is the implementation of a policy aimed at establishing a dominant public sector, including the enterprises presently owned by the state, as well as those which will be expropriated. First, there will be the nationalization of the basic resources controlled by foreign capital and internal monopolies, such as the large mines of copper, iron, saltpeter, and other minerals. Thus, the following will be integrated into the nationalized sector of the economy. 1. The large-scale industries involved in copper, saltpeter, iodine, iron, and coal mining. 2. The financial system of the country, in particular the private banks and the insurance companies. 3. External trade. 4. The large distribution enterprises and monopolies. 5. The strategic industrial monopolies. 6. In general, activities that are decisive for the economic development of the country, such as the production and distribution of electric energy, railways, airlines, and water transportation, communications, production, refining, and distribution of oil and its byproducts, including liquefied gas, the steel industry, cement, petrochemicals and chemicals, cellulose, and paper." End quote. It is clear, then, that the reforms planned by the popular unity in order to broaden state capitalism hit the interests of the powerful clans holding power in Chile. Therefore, it was perfectly possible to foresee that they would respond with deep class hatred and would fight by every means possible, legal and illegal, constitutional and subversive, against those threatening their privileges and their very control of power. It was completely illusory to hope that they would commit a peaceful suicide and to suppose that their respect for their own laws and institutions was greater than their love for their wealth and their traditional control of Chilean politics.